Okay, class, today we are starting a three-part series on gynecological emergencies. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, um, it, it's kind of amazing because they, they lump four chapters in together, and that's basically one-sixth of your uh, National Registry test. So you've got to be good on this part. Uh, it, it's gynecology, obstetrics, and pediatrics. Uh, also includes neonatology. So, again, these are things that you absolutely have to pay attention to and you actually have to be good at. And so, without further ado, let's get into uh, uh, this particular topic. Now, we're talking about gynecology. Uh, we're talking about uh, the branch of medicine that deals with the, the women's reproductive organs. Uh, and, 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 yes, we are dealing with the ladies on all of this, the, the part of the gynecology. And obstetrics is, again, the branch of medicine that deals with the care throughout pregnancy. So again, girl parts, and when when the girl has baby, that's the difference between the two. Uh, again, uh, their, their reproductive organs are internal. They're located within the pelvic cavity. And as we all know, the pelvic cavity's got enough stuff in it already, but then to top it all off, then we add all these other things I involved in the, in the reproductive uh, area. Uh, and then they have external genitalia, which uh, opens to, to that cavity in that body. And for those of you not knowing what those what it looks like, there you go. Merry Christmas! Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure we can start with the, all the dad jokes at this point. Uh, so again, uh, the perineum is that diamond-shaped kin that covers the the uh, and it separates the vagina from the areolus. So it's kind of in between the mons pubis is the fatty layer that's just over the pubic synthesis and the junction of the pubic bones. The labia, there's two of them. The majora and the minora, the, the larger folds, and then the, 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 small, the smaller inner folds. And uh, during arousal, by the way, they do get engorged with blood. Uh, the vestibule is the area that protects the labia minora. Again, it's the, the urethral opening is there, the external opening. Uh, and again, it's, it has two glands on it, uh, the, the skinae and the bartholin glands that lubricate these structures during stimulation. Uh, the hymen is a thin fold of mucous membrane that uh, that forms the external border of the vagina, and it partly closes it. Uh, just because um, an intact hymen is basically some some places consider that to be the virginity that the, they're still a virgin, uh, which is actually not the truth because these things could break uh, just on their own. Uh, the clitoris is the, the innervated and vascular erectile tissue. Uh, in the male, the, the same, it's the tip of the penis, basically. Uh, so it's a cylindrical structure. And again, and then the propuse is the uh, folds of labia minoria that cover, cover the clitoris. Now, uh, the urethra, uh, this actually drains into the urinary bladder. It's about uh, two to three centimeters in length. Uh, some books say four. Uh, and it enables the bacteria to travel more easily into the bladder than in males. Males have a longer urethra. They don't are not susceptible to bladder infections. The ladies are very susceptible to bladder infections, and so we got to keep this in mind when we're caring for them. The, this is the cross section of the anatomy. Again, the uh, the external genitalia, uh, the vagina goes into the cervix. Uh, again, you've got the uterus at this point. This is the muscular shape organ that actually holds the babies. Uh, the fallopian tubes then connect to the ovaries here. Uh, as you can see, the bladder is down here. Uh, so again, when it starts to fill up, it again, causes problems. And then back here also as well, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to obstetrics. Uh, one of the problems is that when baby's right here and they, it starts to press on this, they, they start to press on the rectum and so they think they need to go to the restroom when they really don't. Now, your vagina is uh, about 9 to 10 centimeters in length that connects the external genitalia to the uterus. Uh, the vaginal walls is a, is a crisscross with ridges allowed for stretching during childbirth. So, and again, remember, this thing gets really big during childbirth, okay? It, it's built to do that. And the primary blood supply is from, again, the vaginal artery. Now, again, uh, the, the vagina, it functions for the, for the compu... I'm going to say this wrong. Copulation. There we go receives the penis during sexual intercourse. Again, the birth canal is the final passageway that the infant goes through. So they are the same thing, okay? And then the outer uh, is for, for menstrual blood to leave the body. So yes, it does. It serves as the pipe to shed those the, the endothelial linings. All right, so on the inside, again, the fundus is the top part of the uterus. 
Uh, again, this is the cross section of it. Uh, and the endometrium is on the inside, the myometrium, and then you got the parametrium on the outside of that. We're going to talk a lot more about endometrium when we start talking about endometriosis or endometriitis. All right. Now, the uterus, it's a small, hollow shape about the size of a pear. It's connected to the vagina. And again, it, it's where the fetal development occurs. Uh, but in the non pregnant state, it's usually flat, triangular, uh, not that big. Uh, when it is it has baby, of course, it can go all the way up to the rib cage. Um, Again, there's two major parts is the cervix, the neck, and the body of it. And, of course, the fundus is the top part. And the uh, reason we need to know about the fundus is because, again, if the if patient is having uterine bleeding, uh, especially postpartum bleeding, this is the area that we massage to help reduce the bleeding to the, for, from, the, from vaginal bleeding from uh, childbirth. Oh, let's see here. They have three layers that make up the uterine wall. And again, that endometrium. And this guy is subject to all kinds of infections or problems. And we'll talk about that when it, again, and, and again, usually endometrium, uh, if it's fertilized, then that's what's actually going to be become part of the, the baby's blood supply. It starts to develop placenta. Um, if not, you've got the endometrium, it will then shed and sloth off. The, this is known as menses or the menstrual cycle. Uh, again, your myometrium, again, it's the thick middle layer. That's your muscular part, and the parametrium is the outermost uh, membrane. It allows surgical access to the uterus without risk of infection. So, again, it's actually kind of easier to go in through the parametrium, uh, surgically speaking, to do a cesarean section. Uh, again, the cervix is the neck of the uterus where it connects to the vagina, and, and, and its elasticity is characteri it characterizes the cervix. Uh, what they mean by that is, is that's the thing that they measure when they're in OB that, to, to see if the baby is ready to come out. Again, it, when it reaches, a, when the cervix dilates to a certain point, we know it's ready to pass through the birth canal. It's usually 10 centimeters, by the way. Uh, your ovaries are the female gonads. Uh, they produce, again, they're, they're hormonal as well. They do produce hormones. Uh, they also produce the eggs that develop to go through the fallopian tubes. And again, they secrete several hormones, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Actually, guys, that's the way uh, birth control pills actually work, is it kind of tricks the system, okay? Uh, so again, you got two fallopian tubes. They're thin and flexible. And more importantly, the thing to remember is, is uh, they're thin and flexible to a point because if the baby accidentally attaches in there, you get what's called an ectopic pregnancy, uh, and again, extremely painful and can be life-threatening. Now, your menstrual cycle, uh, again, it, it's, it, it is there when the baby, if you have a fertilized egg, the fertilized egg attaches. When it attaches, great, wonderful. Then uh, again, uh, it, this is the area that the, the blood supply is what nourishes the child once it gets there. If there's not a fertilized egg, the egg will pass. And then again, they will shed that lining. Uh, Menarche, by the way, is the onset of menstrual. That's the very first menstrual cycle. Usually happens between 10 and 14 years of age. Uh, again, and uh, a normal menstrual cycle is is, is uh, different for each each woman. There are some that go 30, 32, but as a standard, usually the 28 days is kind of where they're at. Uh, the period of time between ovulation and menstruation is always 14 days, uh, give or take a couple hours. But yes. Uh, that, that it is usually 14 days is when this happens. And then from puberty to menopause, female sex hormones, again, they control that cycle. And again, uh, that's how the birth control pill works. It kind of tricks it in, into thinking, no, it's not. Uh, so again, the proliferation phase, again, that's the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle. And then in the response, uh, the, the surge of lact luteinizing hormone at day 14, the ovulation takes place at that point. And then, then uh, again, so the good news is, ladies, you were born with about 200,000 ova. Yay! Right. All those chances to get pregnant. I'm sure y'all are really happy about that. Uh, so once during every menstrual cycle, the follicle reaches maturation, and they'll discharge. Now, by the way, it can discharge more than one. Each ovary can discharge one. Uh, again, that's how you get your, your different types of twins. Uh, that is possible. Uh, so what usually happens is that follicle will develop that small yellow brown cells, uh, it will develop the corpus luteum, which will then uh, it will produce progesterone during the second half of the menstrual cycle. That's what the ruptured follicle does. So the, again, it releases the egg, 
into the body, into the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube kind of brushes up against it, accepts the egg, gets it into the fallopian tube, and then, then the follicle starts to produce a different form of hormone. If the egg is not fertilized, again, uh, the corpus luteum will atrophy about three days prior to the onset of the menstrual cycle. And once that, if the egg does fertilize, it, the corpus luteum will produce progesterone until the placenta takes over that function. So your placenta does have a lot of hormonal responsibility. We'll talk about that when we get into the obstetric part. Uh, again, in the, uh, the fallopian tubes, there are little cilia that kind of sweep the egg along. And usually, uh, if the woman has sexual intercourse within 24 hours of ovulation, uh, fertilization can take place. It's not a given. Um, it's amazing how often that happens, so especially when you don't want it. Uh, again, if the egg is fertilized, it normally implants the thick lining of the uterus, so that's where the fetus will develop. And if not, the, that lining is passed through the uterine cavity, and then and it, it, excuse me, the egg gets through the uterine cavity, and then it will start the menstrual cycle, which will expel... The, the receiving blood that was there waiting for the baby. Okay, uh, again, uh, the ischemic phase if the fertilization does not occur, estrogen progesterone levels fall, and then you get vascular changes where the, uh, the endometrium will, it becomes pale and the small blood vessels begin to rupture, and this is where that menstrual cycle starts. The first day is when, when the bleeding lens the last three to five days. It, it varies from a woman to woman. Uh, the, the term heavy flow, light flow, comes from how much bleeding actually does occur. Uh, usually a menstrual cycle is about 50 milliliters of blood that's lost. Um, and then the absence of a menstrual period in women childbearing years who are sexually active should be considered that they're probably pregnant until proven otherwise, okay? Now, of course, we don't have a pregnancy test. Now, if they're sitting there with a positive pregnancy test and, you know, the, the plus symbol, the two lines, whatever the... The, which whatever it is used, uh, yeah, you might, that's a pretty good indication, guys, I'll tell you. Uh, matter of fact, that's usually all the hospital does is take a urine sample and dip it. Okay, now again, the, the premenstrual syndrome, uh, yes, these actually does happen. It does exist. Again, uh, the breast tenderness or engorgement does happen. It, they, you get some bloating, excess fatigue, uh, cravings for specific foods, as a matter of fact. And yes, there are emotional responses, guys. Keep it in check. Okay. Uh, again, the premenstrual dysphoric, uh, disorder, uh, similar to the, the premenstrual syndrome, uh, it's got some severe symptoms of depression, irritability, and tension before menstruation. So yes, this actually does exist. It does, there is a physiologic reason. It's not because she's decided to be mean today. No, absolutely not. These are physiological reasons. Remember, there's a lot of hormonal changes going on during this little particular time. Uh, menopause is a cessation of menses. Uh, and again, I would probably know uh, uh, the your, your first period, your menopause, I would definitely know those terms. Uh, the menstrual period usually continues the age 45 to 55, in which they can still go into menopause. And... And again, it's the end of the reproductive life at that point. Okay, they they will, but they're no longer producing eggs and no longer uh, producing um, uh, the hormonal changes that they do. Problem is, is they're kind of go into a hormonal soup when they reach this this end of life, end of cycle time. Okay, uh, night sweats or, or mood swings are definitely a part of it. Uh, again, hot flashes, hot flashes, hot flashes, hot flashes. They'll literally go from being they can't get cool enough to they're cold and clammy and have to cover up in, in literally the space of maybe 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Uh, again, they will try sometimes to do hormonal uh, replacement therapy to relieve some of the symptoms of this. Uh, that, too, has its own set of side effects. And the biggest one is uh, is your chest pains and your... Um, uh, the real bad ones are the chest pains and, and having a, a pulmonary edema, uh, not pulmonary edema, but the um, pulm uh, pulmonary embolism are the, are the big ones that they have. All right, so we're going to hold up there because that's the end of what's where we're going to start the next slide set. Uh, hope you guys learned a little bit of something there, and uh, I'll see you guys on the next one.